endowment for witnessing. You shall be given power when the Holy Spirit comes to you. Then you shall be witnesses for me. Let us go with Luke to Jerusalem. A few weeks after the resurrection to the Mount of Olives, Jesus of Nazareth was endeavoring to get his men, his apostles, ready for his departing. What a man talks about, what he is saying when he says farewell to his friends, constitutes a significant index to his interest, his concerns. Jesus Christ rates high in this respect. This is what he said to his men. You shall have power when the Holy Spirit comes to you. Then you shall be witnesses for me, not only in Judea, not only in Samaria, but to the very ends of the earth. What a departing and what a commission. If Jesus Christ were to stand here in this auditorium, I believe he would leave out all the frills and niceties and say to us, when the Holy Spirit comes to you, you shall have power, and you shall be witnesses for me, not only in Independence, not only in Jackson County, not only in the Midwest, not only in the United States, but in all lands and to all peoples, to the very ends of the earth. Then he would leave, and we would stand here amazed at the enormity of our assignment. This commission stands out strongly as we note the concerns of Jesus' men. Luke narrates how in these closing days when Jesus Christ and his men were in fellowship together, they turned to him with a good Jewish question. This was the question. Is this the time when you are going to restore the kingdom to Israel? This must have annoyed and hurt Jesus to have his chosen men concerned about such matters. They were limiting things to their own little concerns. Note their emphasis. First, is this the time? Those who do not see the big things, the ongoing work, want schedules. They want God to give them a calendar of events. Second, you're going to restore? Persons with a limited, immature faith are inclined to think, let God do it. And they sing, leave it with God. And they consider that this is real faith. Third, the kingdom of Israel. This is the juvenile view of expecting God to bring to pass what we want, what we want specifically, with certain advantages to us. These disciples of Jesus were concerned that the kingdom of Israel would be restored with certain priorities to the Israelites. Jesus' reply was brief but direct. He told these men not to be concerned with such speculations and finalizations and expectancies. He pointed them to them the main thing. They were to be witnesses for Christ Jesus. And he left this strong implication, witnesses do not indulge in speculation. I fear that if some of our people were to speak up and ask Christ Jesus about matters, that some of us might push to the fore, and he would need to come as directly to us as he did to these men in the Mount of Olives. He would have to say, do not indulge in speculation. Do not wait for God to do the job. Do not set up your times as to when the world is going to come to an end. Do not indulge in idle dreams about a coming endowment. Do not try to locate the place to which Christ will return. Do not get into fancies about the millennium. And then he would turn to us directly and say, I have a tremendous job for you to do. And when you set yourselves to it, you shall receive endowing help. Think big. You are to be witnesses for me. And you are to be witnesses in Kansas City, in Buenos Aires, in Fiji, in Aruba, in Africa, 
in Australia, and he would call us to the main things. Luke used a pretty strong word out of Greek life when he said, you shall be my witnesses. His Greek word for witness was martores. This is the root from which the word martyr comes. It signifies that one who gives testimony stakes his life on what he says. And this is not a matter of polite civilities. This is a matter of placing one's life on the truthfulness of one's testimony. Jesus was saying this, Men, you are going to stake your whole life on the witness you bear. You are going to validate your testimony by your life. This high rating of witness bearing was with the Jewish people. You remember the ninth commandment of the Decalogue says, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Now, in many cultures, lying artistically is considered a social art. Not so in the religion of the righteous God. He speaks the truth, and he expects his people to do so. The code of Hammurabi of Babylon was strong in this requirement. The person who bore false witness, when discovered, was to suffer the penalty for the crime of which he accused another. Yes, this word for witnesses was a strong word, martores. It implied that the witness for Christ was to stake his whole life on his testimony. The eleven men had indicated their concern about Israel's future. They might have sung, Jesus loves us, this we know. Father Abram tells us so. And they might have sung another stanza, When it's time to dwell in clover, God will come and take things over. And a third stanza might go along, God will break down hostile powers, then the kingdom will be ours. Jesus rose high above such a notion. He said to his men, Your mission is to all the world. Yes, you're to start in Jerusalem and move out into all the world. You're even to go to Samaria. You're not to go as doomsters, as arrogant declaimers, as proclaimers of Israel's superiority. You are to go as witnesses. True witness is present tense, is contemporary. Religionists need to realize this. So often, believers tend to go back and review stories of former years that they have read and glorified. And the repetition of the happenings in the life of Jesus of Nazareth some two centuries ago are set forth as the testimony. Or we quote golden texts saying such as, God so loved the world that he gave. Past tense. Or we are inclined to set forth a doctrinal formula or a theological statement as if this were testimony. And we Latter-day Saints can go back a century and a half and narrate the story of those years. What I'm saying is not discount of these happenings. These provide guidings, foundationing materials. I'm saying that this is not enough today. We're to be living witnesses who can bring experience out of our lives in the living now. We are to be witnesses, not reporters. In our contemporary life, as in all other ages, there is a deluge of news that is anything but encouraging, anything but uplifting. As realists, we are aware of this. And this will condition how we're going to witness. But brothers and sisters, recounting of direful, distressful, deteriorating news is not to be our witness. This is not saying that all of us are to be saying with a little English girl, God's in his heaven, all's right with the world. First, I do not place God way out there somewhere, and I do not see everything all right in the world. But in the midst of confusion and materialism and eroticism and the like, we're to stand up and witness 
that God is working now, lifting men as men will permit God to do it. The Latter-day Saint who sees everything gone wrong, everything on a downward trend, cannot witness for God, for Christ. He has nothing to say. One night a messenger, a witness, made a testimony over Bethlehem. And Luke puts it this way, Fear not, I bring you good news with great joy, which shall be to all people. And then he continues with his witness. I spoke of this this morning, but I'm going to repeat it. Recently, I have been telling of the version that a small boy gave two years ago. I think it's the best translation I've found. He was to be the angelic messenger in a Christmas program. He had memorized those lines from Luke's Gospel. And when he stood before the congregation in his angel robes, he was so overwhelmed he forgot his lines. But he had a general idea, so he burst forth with this. Hi there, everybody. i got good news for you. This is my favorite translation. I consider this is the essence of witnessing. The witness brings good news. Now, Jesus said quite forthrightly, you're not ready to go out as witnesses yet. Something has to happen in you. He was seeing that these men might have gone out and reported what had happened in Jesus' life. They had to have something happen in them if they were going to be witnesses. Soon this Jesus would be past tense. He tried to get his men to see that the kind of ministry that he had brought them is personal. Bodily presence would come to them. They believed again. And then when this uh, power of Christ would come, they would know the living, guiding presence of God. They would not then wait for his return. They would get busy while he was away. So Jesus told them to tarry in Jerusalem until they should in receive the endowment that would qualify them to witness. And the company of disciples returned to Jerusalem. But... Their tarrying was not sitting down waiting for God to do something. A modern translation of the book of Acts says that they met together by common consent. With the expectation that they would be working on, they sought direction in naming a successor for Judas. It is of note that they wanted a man who had been with Jesus, who had seen the resurrected Christ. They wanted a man who could be a witness. It is also worth noting that Luke says that this newly ordained apostle, Matthias, was considered equally an apostle with the eleven. The movement was to continue. This day of Pentecost was to equip these disciples for witnessing. It's likely that they were wondering how God could and would endow them for this assignment. The account opens with the narrative of the visible manifestations of sounds and movements. This includes the speaking in tongues. Then it moves on. It moves on then to the great story of what happened inside these disciples. Here was the tremendous miracle. The less mature person is inclined to think of the day of endowment in terms of signs and wonders, in terms of narratable happenings that could make headlines. Let it be said again, the miracle was what happened inside these disciples. They'd been frustrated, uncertain. Now they could go out with assurance. They had a witness. These disciples had to experience firsthand this ministering of the Holy Spirit. Up to this time, they had depended upon the presence, the physical presence of Jesus. And this reliance would have limited the working of the endowment to the single place where Jesus Christ himself would be. Now they experience this spiritual influence without his bodily presence. Now these disciples could go anywhere and expect to receive 
this spiritual unction. This had to happen in these disciples before they could go out into the world. This endowment was present tense. Many persons who want the rehappening of the day of Pentecost with the expectation that there will be a grand outburst of speaking in tongues, of glossolalia, as we refer to it in technical terminology. Sometimes I have asked some why they wanted such a dramatic expression, and some have said, and these are the words, wouldn't that be a thriller? And my immediate comeback, God is not going to give an outpouring of the gift of tongues so persons can get a thriller and have some headline conversation. There'd have to be a good reason for it. There was such a reason on that day of Pentecost. This was God's way of breaking over the barriers of language and of cultural loyalties that narrowed and hemmed in. That day, glossolalia was urgently needed. You know, the Jews thought that God spoke Hebrew, classic Hebrew. They even sometimes considered it heretical to translate the scriptures into other languages. Let those who wanted to read these sacred writings learn Hebrew. And you know, folks, I'm quite certain that as a boy, I thought of God as speaking the English language. Let us ask ourselves what language we think of God speaking today. What a collection of languages and cultures assembled on that day of Pentecost. There were persons from Asia, from Africa, from Europe. The speaking was not in some emotional blah, blah. The languages were identifiable. There was content in what was said. And that day the endowed disciples leaped out of their Jewish provincialism and were ready to go to witness for their Christ who would speak in any language. What an expansion of mission that was. In some ways, it would do this conference well to have such an outpouring of tongues. Yet I would not pray for it. Many would never catch the import, the directive. They'd go home and tell of the many tongues and of the thrill of it. I see us needing something like this to broaden our perspectives in our sense of mission. Such an experience would carry with it the directive to go into all the world, to witness into every land and to all peoples. We would not be expecting converts to learn to speak our language, the English language. As a young man of 20, I sat on the platform at our reunion in the Des Moines district. Here was a Pentecostal morning. A brother rose and spoke to the saints in a tongue quite strange to me. I was sitting on the platform. I was a young man in the district presidency. That was the reason for it. And he placed his hand on my shoulder and spoke to me. Now, many would think how wonderful that would be. I react somewhat differently. You know, folks, every time God has spoken to me, he's given me something more to do. And as I sat there, I wondered what would be said when the message was interpreted. I wondered if it would be rebuke or acceptance or assignment or what. And when the interpretation came, I was told that in my lifetime, I would cross the waters and go to many lands, to many peoples, to many languages. Quite fittingly, this was first spoken in a tongue that was strange to me. I believe that discriminating saints caught the appropriateness of the use of another tongue. This pushed us out into the world of many languages. Now follow. It would be well for me to add that some of the saints who put God on a hurry-up schedule expected me to start right off and leave at once for some other countries. And when I went to college and to university, and when I went to teach at Grayson College, some of these wondered if I were really true to my calling. Had not I been told that I would go to other countries across the water? And the perplexity was enhanced 
When I first went to Grayson, I enrolled in a study of Norwegian. I was supposed to go to Norway. A siege of typhoid halted this and diverted me from going to this field. A few wondered if this severe illness, which threatened to be terminal, was judgment upon me for going to college rather than to other lands. Later on, I sat on the platform of the Lamoni State Reunion. A brother spoke to me in tongues and said that I was where God wanted me to be. Here, it was almost 30 years before that first council came, that came to me before I crossed the ocean and went to Europe. I guess it took quite a while to get me ready. I do not consider myself a linguist. I have greater appreciation for the phenomenon of language than I do for any one specific language in which I might become proficient. In October 1958, I was ordained to be a, pe a patriarch to all the church. This meant that I should get out beyond the limitations of an English-speaking world. And I assure you that it is exacting for me to go into a mission field of the church where the culture is different and the language is strange. I try to live with the people, to achieve some indigenous appreciation of their patterns of thinking and of their values. In this I consider that I have been signally blessed. And after a while I can stand side by side with saints of other languages and cultures and sense spiritual fraternity with them. They're my brothers and sisters in Christ. I've sought to work so that God would find me ready for his endowing help. As patriarch to the church, I have given patriarchal blessings in several situations where the recipient and I did not speak the same language. The naive prayer would be for some that God would bless me with tongues so I would speak in the native language. I have never prayed this way. I believe if it were the expedient thing to do, this could happen. God always has me take the course that requires me to do a lot of work. I have prayed for a facility in speaking so a translator could get the message. I have prayed for a spiritual community so we would sense oneness. In this way, I have given patriarchal blessings that have had to be translated into Dutch, into French, into German, into Japanese, into Korean, into Spanish, into Tahitian. The sense of universal fraternity has been with me, and God was wanting me to witness to conscientious saints. I sought for the light, for the direction suited for that occasion. Now, God promises endowment to those who are going to do something for him, with him. I recall a brother who told me that he had been praying and fasting and sacrificing that he might have the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in endowing proportions. He was very concerned about this. He'd not experienced anything like he wanted. We were friends, so I could speak freely, frankly. And I asked him directly what he wanted to do for which he was wanting additional endowment. He looked puzzled, so I repeated the question. He was still perplexed. And then I said, God is not going to give unusual endowment to any person just for the thrill this person will get out of it. This man had never thought of this. He thought he might fast and pray and then go to some place, some shrine, and be enveloped with endowing power. He had nothing in mind to do, no ministry to extend. He wanted a thriller. And then, as he said, he would have a testimony. And that bothered me more. There would be little witnessing in such a self-centered motivation and very little testimony. Jesus Christ told his disciples, 
when he was getting ready to leave them, that they would be endowed for the work that they were going to do. We can be mismotivated by wanting in wanting endowment. This bothers me with some of our people. Once I conversed with a good elderly brother who had expressed himself in tongues. As we talked, he said that he had sought that gift for some time. And I told him that I considered this rather unusual. We do not search for a gift of the Spirit. This is at God's discretion and desire. We are to work for the fruits of the Spirit. Then God may endow us, especially in this particular line, until the fruit reaches the proportion and the nature of a gift. And then I asked him why he wanted the gift of tongues. He was very honest. He said that he believed that he would stand in better with the saints if he had the gift of tongues. He was conscientious about this. And I believe that he did bring help and encouragement to many of our people. But his motivation for wanting the gift was not sound. His concern was for his own standing. Later I found that sometimes he'd be invited to come to a congregation, to a conference, and to a reunion so that they might be the gift of tongues there. An unsound motivation on the part of the saints. Let it be repeated. Endowment is granted persons and groups as we enter into God's work devotedly. These need the extra for which they are called. When I came into the Restoration Church as a youth, I was intrigued by the frequent mentioning of the Holy Spirit. I realized that the Spirit was essential in the life of the Church. When, however, I would make inquiries, I would not find out very much. I would be given quotations out of the Bible which did not speak as a rule to me, and they did not speak in the thinking of the times. They didn't help me. It did not connect with my investigation about the nature of man and the nature of the universe and the nature of God. And when I went on to the university, I got in deep considerations of the person, of how the person comes to be, of the forces that bring to pass personhood of high quality. I'll say this that I don't think I've said before. Yes, I studied a lot of theology. I studied a lot of church history in those. I did not put together my interpretation of the Holy Spirit from courses in theology and church history. They did not say much of anything about the Holy Spirit. I went to my studies in sociology and philosophy that explored the nature of the person. And I saw how persons are shaped in interperson influence. And I saw how the Holy Spirit is the outreaching dynamic of God, touching and influencing the lives of persons when these persons will permit. I saw this as Brother Albert once wrote, I have often seen the Spirit or our congregations bend like the strong electric presence of a dearly loved friend. Those who are translating will note that I'm skipping lots of pages. Once William Hawking, New England philosopher, observed, great men and great causes have kindling capacity. There is a magnetic outreach for such persons. These do not try to possess us, to manage us, to manipulate us to their own advantage. These consider us persons in our own right. And something of noble influence comes from such persons to others. Ralph Waldo Emerson once wrote, The great teacher is not the man who supplies the most facts, but the one in whose presence we become different people. Jesus of Nazareth exerted such an influence. His men caught his genuineness, his concern for others, his noble purpose. And this is expressed in the comment of a woman in the Hull House area of Chicago when she learned of the death of Jane Addams. And this Italian woman said, She allus a pull me up. This ordinary woman felt strengthened in noble desire and good intent 
when she was in the association of Jane Addams. This is the exertion of the Holy Spirit on those who respond. There is uplifting, transforming influence. There is pull up. When two youth had been to a rip-roaring meeting in which there was considerable talk about the Holy Spirit, one said, Wow, do I ever feel good. Wow, we. And the other responded, Yeah, well, what do you feel good for? This is a question we ought always to ask about any meeting or individual experience in which we say, The Spirit is here in power. In another situation, a youth called out, Do I ever feel the power? And a friend asked, Power to do what? God grants the endowment of the Holy Spirit to bring to pass something of merit in the lives of persons. In our contemporary world, there can be significant testimony in witnessing that we're not alone. And the Spirit of God in our fellowshipping presence, we shall be able to speak of this assurance of this communion. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Jesus called his men to spiritual friendship. That closing evening circle with his men in the upper room stands out to me as one of the foremost happenings in the life of Nazareth. He's getting to, really, to leave his men. He's trying to get his men ready for the parting, and they do not see they think that he'll be gone a short while and return. And he tells his men that while he will be leaving, he'll not leave them alone. He says that his father, their father, will send them another comforter. My friends know that I stress that Jesus did not say he was going to send them a sympathizer or a tranquilizer. No, a comforter would be coming to them. And the word comforter stands out. The second syllable signifies strength. The first syllable, the prefix, expresses together. These would be strengthened as they got together with God. As these men would get with God, they would have the strength to stand up with courage, with courage. And Jesus said, henceforth, I'll call you friends. Some of our people have expectations of the sudden coming of some high-geared endowment. Some day in some designated place this will come. If such were to take place, many would not be wise enough, experienced enough to utilize all this. If this were to take place, such happenings do not come all at once. There may be an identifiable, intense experience. This does happen. But if this were to take place, there would be deficiency in our people for the utilization of the spiritual testimony. I would be concerned about the witness that would be given, a witness with lots of warmth, with little insight. This could rebound. Sometimes in the years of our early Restoration Church, we became very intent on witnessing, and many times the witness was not sufficiently illuminating about what the church's mission and message was. And we drew in many persons who never got hold of the heart of the Restoration Movement. A few years ago, I was asked to be a, a visiting teaching minister in an encampment of elders at Camp Donovan. They wanted me to talk of the endowment. I did some real searching. I was aware that for many, endowment connoted some intense, dramatic experience that involved healing, speaking in tongues, prophetic expression, the singing of angels, and the like. And I ask, is this the kind of endowment that God has in mind? What is this endowment to cause to happen in the lives of persons, in the life of the Church? I sought light. God does not give me easy answers. One day in the quiet, I sensed a directive to the hymn that we call Admonition. I went back to the story of the singing in the prayer meeting in the Stone Church in Independence in 1907. In Joseph Luff's autobiography, I found some of his concerns about getting the work of the Church well established in Independence. And once he said, My most convincing testimony of this Latter-day work has not come by these ways, 
but in the gradual revelation of its strange adaptation to human necessity. And Joseph Luff has been rated as a spiritual giant with prophetic gifts. He saw the foremost testimony of the gospel as happening in the lives of persons. When Joseph Luff stood over here in the stone church and sang that hymn, he'd been in the ministry many years. He'd been an apostle in 1887. This hymn has to be lived in its entirety. Usually the stanza that gives the key message is omitted when it's printed. It's omitted out of our hymnal. And this is the core of the message. Would you dwell on heights above? Heed you then this admonition. Climb to atmospheres of love. That is the key message in that hymn. Do you want to get up there on the endowed level? Climb to atmospheres of love. Here is the word admonition, which gives the title for the hymn. And the key message of the hymn is this, Climb to atmospheres of love. I read this with fervent spirit and keen insight. Why had I never seen this before? Why have we left this stanza out of our usual printing? Then I saw the essence of endowment was getting up to the higher levels of saintly living. And how often God calls us to the high places where shall we shall be able to be with him and then return to the places where witnessing is needed and needed urgently. And I hear the call of John Muir, the great naturalist, climb the mountains and get the good tidings. Then continue the theme of love. Love ye me and love all people. Love as I am loving you. This your calling, this your purpose. Thus be my disciples true. And then we go on to the climactic part. Then as we come up, to this level and live together in love. Forth from thence your testimony shall to trembling nations go, and the world confess that with you God has residence below. This is the core of witnessing. As we live lovingly with the love of God, we saints shall so live that others will sense that God is living with us. I'm bringing now a testimony out of my own life. I do not, uh, I do so for it involves expression of what I'm advocating today. In no way do I hold this up for somebody to duplicate it. It's a chapter out of my own book of Acts. May I interject this? Conventional homiletics tends to discount any personal testimony in preaching. This is fallacious, textbookish, and devitalizing. The preacher is never to parade himself, never to billboard himself. But he has nothing out of his own life to contribute. He can hardly witness to anybody else. Well, something happened in the witnessing venture of a handful of Latter-day Saints that brought me in contact with the church. God was in it. God was back of it. I lived in a small town in central Iowa in the area of the church known as the Des Moines District. In this little town was a small company of saints who met in a private home. I'd never heard of them. It looks as if they had just kind of been marking time. And then one day the district president called to his home the young missionary to the district and said pointedly, the voice of the spirit is that you shall go to Rhodes. The missionary looked back in surprise and said, Rhodes? Why, nothing's ever happened in Rhodes. And he was thinking, and nothing ever will. The district president said simply but forthrightly, the voice of the Spirit is that you shall go to Rhodes. So contact was made with the president of the little branch at Rhodes. He and his fellow saints were half-hearted, but they consented to try once more. They rented a hall in the town and scheduled some meetings. This same good spirit got to working on a few of these saints, and they reached out to my sister and to me to invite us to help with the music in the series. They did more than invite. They got busy praying. I remember when the series closed, a young woman, about the only young woman in the group, said to me, now we can take a rest. I said, what do you mean? She said, we're all prayed out. Some of our people never have concernies. They only have prospects, and the two are not the same. 
Then God blessed the missionary with some endowing power. And one night this evangelistic man, by the way, this has never been paraded, had an unusual experience. I don't know whether it was in vision or what it was. He saw me before him, and God said to him, I have need of this young man in my work. Something was added to this missionary's insight and his concern. And then he prayed, God help me. I need to know how to reach out to him. I was wise. If he'd tried to pressure me or to use unsound ways of thinking, I would have turned aside. But God was pulling me too. He gave me no signs, no miracles. He made me get busy and work on the job. He intended that I find out what I would be getting into. But there was drawing power, and I kept going to find out some more. I was drawn by the testimonial of a living, revealing God working today as much as ever. And God was made the living, functioning, responding God of today. And I can and do testify that the Spirit of God was reaching to me before I was baptized. I want you to see the scene now. On a Tuesday afternoon, January 14th, at 2 o'clock, the baptismal service was to be held. Three had given their names for baptism. I had not. At noon, I met at his invitation the missionary a block from the schoolhouse. I was a junior in high school. He wanted to see me. I had struggled all that morning, and I walked up to him and said, I shall be baptized today. He'd waited, he'd hoped, he'd prayed. And I had struggled, and I'd struggled alone. You know what I said? I'll give it a try. I'll try it, and if it turns out to be a hoax, I'll go out as honestly as I came in. And God knew I meant it. That Tuesday afternoon, the townspeople came to see the baptism. Nothing like this had ever happened in that village. It was mid-January, and the baptismal font was in a lake pond by the town, and a rectangle was cut in the ice, and a stepladder was used for steps. The townspeople stood on the embankment, and a small company of saints stood by the edge of the ice. The picture is vivid in my mind. And after the baptism, the missionary told a very few understanding friends of his experience. He said that as I walked across the ice to the font, his soul was baptized in the good spirit, in confirmation, in joy. And he said the only time in his life this happened, he heard a celestial choir singing. I didn't hear anything. When God, the district president, the missionary, and a handful of saints got together in evangelistic concern, in testimony-bearing living, there was endowment. And I came into the Church of Jesus Christ through endowed witnessing. And this endowment is available for us today. On the closing Sunday of the last November, I was in a company of 18 saints in the closing meeting of a retreat of workers of that area in Seoul, Korea. I had looked forward to this meeting with concern and with sense of responsibility. There had grown within me the realization that I should bring this company some message of prophetic counsel. How often I wished another would do this, yet as the days went by I knew this was to be my ministry. I had to look to getting the saints ready for such ministry and myself ready for endowing guidance. This kept standing before me. These saints of the Orient need to receive prophetic ministry and to be assured that God is concerned in them and responding to them, that such endowment was not to be considered by them as expressed only in the center areas. I worked, and the saints responded in readying themselves. This was not by some frantic, exaggerated praying and fasting. This was through getting in tune with God in honest concern, and the way was open. Here were saints of Korea, of Japan, 
of Okinawa, of Taiwan, of Vietnam, of America, joined in spiritual fraternity. I've told how the prayers for the bread and then the prayer for the wine were spoken in three languages, Korean, Japanese, English. And our universal Father, through his universalizing spirit, was able to bring endowing help. I get restless and concerned with those who are setting up expectancy for some all-engulfing event to take place in some in coming days in which the Church will be overwhelmingly endowed. That's for God and for us to get ready. And I remember Jesus' counsel against such future-looking, against speculating, against chronicling God. I'm concerned about our motivations. I'm wondering if some of these are wanting God to come across in mighty power and do things for us. Here I affirm we do not need to wait for some tomorrow. God is ready and anxious to endow us for witnessing today as we make ready. He's wanting to, us to see what constitutes genuine endowment and vital witnessing. And let our witnessing speak of what is taking place in the lives of persons in the living now. And let our witnessing reflect the highest expression of endowment on the planes of love, understanding that's vital and inclusive. Let us go forth out of this conference with resolution to make ready for endowment for and witnessing right now. And this evening, my fellow witnesses, who are your witnesses going to be? Come on. Don't you shake that off. Who are your witnesses going to be? Name them specifically. Identify them. I mean specific persons and families and congregations. What is the witness we are going to express in evangelistic testimony? What is our good news of the endowing power of God that enlightens and lifts us up? In this meeting are hundreds and hundreds of potential witnesses. This endowing power is available to us as we get with God his way. And this evening, let us say together what Peter said on that first day of Pentecost. We're all witnesses. We shall be witnesses for Christ with love for all mankind. We'll share with joy the gospel news that men the way may find. With promise of endowing power, we'll leave our conference Christ, commissioned to go forth right now as witnesses for Christ. Here on Mount Zion comes the call by Jesus Christ, our friend. He's saying unto everyone, My son, it's you I send. <laughs>